much for inviting me uh, to participate in this very important um, initiative. Um, my name is Dr. Lena Chelyshev and I'm studying cheetahs for 36 years now. But every day is different and I'm very happy to share what I've learned and what really cheetahs experience and what we have to do to keep them safe on earth. Um, first of all, I can tell that cheetahs are very adaptable species. You can find them in any type of terrain. Uh, for example, in Kalahari Desert, if you look into the uh, left and upper photo, you can see cheetah uh, in the sand. There's no water there. And to survive, cheetahs actually drink urine and blood of their kills and they eat summer melon, the fruit which contains the water 95%. They perfectly adopt to live uh, in high mountains, like for example, in Ethiopia, um, they're living in the uh, environment which is uh, four and a half thousand meters over the sea level and they hunt mountain gazelles and goats uh, exactly like leopards do so it's really easy to confuse cheetah for a leopard uh, they adopt to live in the thick bush and uh, all over africa where bushes are where cheetahs live uh, they adopt to kill big animals very slow moving antelopes or small things like for example hyraxes uh, rabbit monkeys and dig digs and uh, you can see on the bottom right photo from Iran. There is an Iranian cheetah they adopt to live in the snow. During the autumn time, they grow very thick and long fur. Uh, cheetah is the fastest mammal on land and uh, it's built actually for speed and it's built very similar to uh, racing dogs like greyhounds, but there is a huge difference. Cheetahs are sprinters while dogs are stairs, which means that cheetah can run very fast but for very short time and very short distance. And you can see the difference between the speed in captivity and in the wild. Basically in captivity we set up a lower course and the cheetah is just running to catch teddy bear or something like bait, but in the wild cheetahs following uh, natural prey. That's why uh, the speed is much lower. Also, if we put together racing dog and the cheetah, cheetah will overtake within seconds and then it will give up. So the problem, cheetah cannot really run for a long time. And that's what happens. Uh, sometimes lions and hyenas can exhaust cheetahs and lions pretty often kill even adult cheetahs. Um, Surprisingly, cheetahs cross rivers, they don't avoid water, water and sometimes they cross Mara River, which is um, very wide, I would say, um, sometimes cross twice a day. And uh, they're equally active during night and day. They can hunt, they mate, they travel. So they perform all types of activities during the full, absolutely full darkness. And um, because cheetahs can really climb trees, um, it's really easy to confuse cheetahs for a leopard, especially when they're resting up a tree, but there's a huge difference. Only a leopard can climb a tree with a kill. We'll understand why, because you know, actually local communities very often confuse cheetah and a leopard because of this habit, taking kill up on a tree. Unique, absolutely unique social system in cheetah. Cheetahs can be solitary or they can live in groups. For example, um, there can be uh, temporary groups, when mother leaves the cubs, they're staying together for approximately from two weeks to up to half a year. And amazingly, not only males can form coalitions, which is a lifetime, lifelong uh, union, but also females can do that. But these uh, unions are temporary. And recently in the model, we had a coalition of two females. And what is amazing, uh, on the upper right photo, there's a coalition of five males. Uh, and not all, all of them are uh, related. This high level of sociality um, actually helps cheetahs to 
even adopt cubs. For example, we had two females. On the bottom, there is a uh, Naritoi, and on top is Maserian. And um, actually, what happened, um, Naritoi on the bottom and uh, Naserian on the uh, upper photo. Um, both of them raised cubs, but they spent lots of time in Tanzania. And one day, one female came without cubs and she was sick. And unfortunately, she died. She could not survive. But her sister came in a couple of months with two boys. And we were very happy. But there was something different in these cups. And when I compared the photo because of the behavior, one male was a little bit bigger, one smaller, one was more brave, and one was more shy. When I looked into the photo, I said, there is something interesting about this family. And I found out that the male who is closer to the mother is actually stepson. It's a son of the sister of Aritoi. While um, the other one who was very shy, he's on the left on the photo, he's her own uh, son. And um, watching them was like a soap opera. Every day I was rushing to the field because it's very, uh, really unique thing to observe. Uh, this high level of sociality actually helped humans to uh, realize that it's easy to tame cheetahs and use uh, for hunting for themselves. And it was very, very, um, um, let's say common um, royal sport hunting with cheetahs for people and um, by, by 16th century all royal courts in Europe even in Russia um, uh, it was um, all royal courts by 16th century in Russia in Europe uh, were having 10 cheetahs it was a sign of royalty and um, you can see that even in Kenya in 1930s, cheetahs were very popular pets. And nowadays, in Emirates. And at the same time, cheetahs are hunted. They have been hunted and they're still hunted, even now. Uh, basically, why it's important um, to save cheetahs. Why cheetahs in my life? First of all, if we look onto the home range, uh, previous range of cheetahs, which is gray color, in Asia and in Africa, you can see that uh, they were occupying huge areas. But now these red dots are the remaining cheetah small populations. And uh, in the beginning of 20th century, just imagine there were more than 100 cheetahs all over the world in Africa and in Asia. But in the, in the end of the same century, only 15,000. Now we have around 7,000 cheetahs in the wild. It's nothing. And actually population all over the world is going down every day. So if we don't save uh, cheetahs now, probably in 50 years, they might be not here. What is interesting, um, apart from five identified uh, subspecies of cheetahs, three have uh, genetic difference. In 2011, there was a research showing that there are three genetically different really cheetahs. It's Asiatic cheetah, Atsononyx sibatus venaticus, um, Atsononyx sibatus sibatus from Southern Africa and from the uh, um, Middle Africa, it's not uh, about to say So this gives really uh, good hope. Basically, the biggest cheetahs population are in the Southern Africa, Botswana, uh, Zimbabwe, and South Africa, and Namibia, and in Eastern Africa, which is Kenya and Tanzania. And the major problems which cheetahs experience all over the world is loss of habitat. Of course, humans take, we take over the land, not only of cheetahs, but of, of other species. And um, home range of cheetahs is really shrinking every year, every month. Um, diseases, accidental snaring, like you can see in Tanzania on the bottom photo. Uh, snares are set up for other animals, but sometimes cheetahs die in them. Trophy hunting and illegal trade, which is really, really high. And uh, accidental road kills, like this cheetah, which is on the left hand photo, was hit by the car in Kenya. She, she was pregnant with six cubs. So basically, each individual really matters for the survival of the species. Our study area, we will be talking today uh, about Mara site because that's where we conduct behavioral observations, which really help us to understand um, survival strategies of these uh, animals. Because Mara is actually a highly human habitated area and cheetahs have to survive there. And um, our study area mainly is in the reserve and some conservancies around. There's a, re uh, there's a big difference between management of the reserve and conservancies. And um, that really affects cheetah um, numbers and cheetah movement too. Uh, 
So basically, if we look onto the cheetah population, which we are monitoring from 2011 uh, to date, we can see that it's not stable, it's fluctuating. Some years we have more cheetahs, some, uh, some years less. Um, it's because of some diseases, uh, predator attacks, and also recruitment, which means that some cheetahs, for example, in 2017, 10 cheetahs raised 23 cubs to independence, which was really great addition to the uh, database because we don't count cubs. Any day something can happen to them. Only when they separate from the mothers, that's the day when we add them to their database. So general uh, problems which cheetahs experience, for example, in the Mara. Uh, first of all, I can tell that in every area, in each country, in each um, sub-area, cheetahs adopt to certain circumstances and environment. So, for example, we'll be talking about the Mara. What do they experience? First of all, um, all animals actually can chase cheetahs from the shade or even from the kills. Amazingly, not only baboons take meat from the cheetahs, but also war dogs. They sometimes chase cheetahs, especially with small cubs. You can see that even water bugs, antelopes chase cheetahs. And hyenas, in the, uh, they actually affect cheetah survival because of um, because they eat cubs and they take away kills from cheetahs, which means that if cheetah is nursing and she's losing uh, food for a week, she will lose the milk and cubs will die. Leopards also attack cheetahs and this uh, unfortunate um, female who we call Sidai, which means beautiful, uh, she was sharing area with this male uh, leopard for 10 years. But one day something happened and she lost her vigilance. She was killed. He was eating her up on a tree for five days. So that's a nature. Lions cause lots of problems because they kill cheetahs, cubs and adults, but they don't eat them. And unfortunately, uh, some cheetahs um, suffer, uh, let's say, because um, so some cheetahs die like uh, small cubs, uh, middle sized cubs, middle aged cubs, and also adults. For example, on the right and down photo, there is a male who came to meet with a female. There were actually 11 cheetah males around one female within three days. And um, we found him in the morning killed by a lion. You can see that uh, his head is in blood because that's how lions kill. They actually crack the skull of a cheetah. And according to the posture, the cheetah was really suffering. So other problems cheetahs experience are some diseases, conditions like, for example, uh, viral uh, infections, sarcoptic mange, um, and uh, some fatal injuries. But what is amazing, cheetahs really can survive and heal themselves. There's no need for interference because even from mange, even from the last stage of mange, cheetahs sometimes recover. And uh, you can see on the bottom, a uh, female who had four cubs uh, came from Tanzania with her cubs with such a very fresh and long uh, and deep wound. But fortunately enough, she survived and she recovered. Within two months, you can see, uh, now you can see only the small scar. Another, uh, another problems which cheetahs experience are uncontrolled fire. Uh, for example, cheetah on the down of photo, there's a cheetah who gave birth in ravine and then one day fire came from the side of Tanzania and we had to stop this fire. Uh, fortunately enough, cheetahs survived, but cubs were too small to move because you can see when cheetah is choosing the place for giving the birth, she is actually, um, when cheetah is uh, looking for the safe place for the birth, uh, to give a birth, she is, um, she considered to stay there for at least one and a half month. So you can see the grass was very tall. In this case, grass of course was burnt and uh, despite the fact that cubs survived in the ravine, when mother started moving from that area, she was losing them one by one. But fortunately, she raised one cub, which was really good. Because basically, a uh, survival uh, rate is very low. Um, another adaptation, very large number of cubs. It's said to be compensation for the high um, cubs uh, mortality. We recorded female with seven cubs. And uh, these are types of dams. You see cheetahs don't build it, actually any dam. They just give birth in the patch of grass or in the bush, in ravines, and that's where they're more successful, actually. Uh, and um, as I pointed out, cheetah survival rate is very low. 76, almost, percent of cubs are dying because of predation within the first three months of age. That's why those cheetahs who give birth, for example, in the territory of the reserve, um, we are trying to protect the dens and even we don't go there. So it's very vulnerable period for cubs. And we're waiting for the time when female will show up with cubs. But with rangers, 
we close these areas um, um, pretty far away from the dam and waiting for the uh, cubs to show up. Unfortunately, sometimes we find out that some um, not careful drivers um, drive over the sign, maybe intentionally, maybe not, but they ruin the road signs or maybe pretending that um, um, they didn't see that. So that's really sad. Um, so if we're talking about tourism, um, last year, for example, Mara, uh, Masai Mara National Reserve plus Mara Triangle, which is uh, part of the Ma Masai Mara National Reserve, um, met 400,000 visitors. Because tourists are coming to the Mara every day and even in, uh, during the low season, it's really interesting thing that we found out that basically for cheetahs in Masai Mara, it's better to be adopted to cars, tolerant, but not dependent on cars. Because uh, sometimes we have our cheetahs, our, I mean those who are um, mostly resident, uh, residential cheetahs in the Mara or in Kenya, um, who can easily cross the road in between the cars when they are not moving. Uh, but cheetahs who are coming from Serengeti with cubs or just males who are coming to mate with the females, they get stressed. They can't come closer than 200 meters, 100 meters to cars. And by that, they lose opportunity to hunt successfully, to breed successfully. Or for females, it's very difficult to raise cubs. They're really stressed. But cheetahs and the mother really uh, got adopted to uh, the vehicles. And some of them used to use vehicles as a um, shade or protection. Um, or even observation for it. Um, we, what we found out that some cheetah females got so much dependent on cars that they would teach their cubs uh, to go under the car when they needed the shade or they go uh, up a car to observe their um, territory and also go behind the car when they want to hide uh, or hunt. But um, when these cheetah cubs grow up, they might come um, across some visitors who won't provide them this. And cheetahs might lose life because they won't know how to adopt to live by themselves. And also, when cheetahs climb elevated objects, they mark them. And this marking is a message meant to another cheetah. And it's a very important message because, for example, female can mark a turkey showing that she's ready for mating. Uh, males mating, um, males marking territory showing that they're owners of this uh, particular area. So when the cub is gone with a message, it means that other cheetahs will never get it. And again, it affects cheetah interaction. Uh, also, cheat, um, also cars are not really uh, proper objects for climbing. And we had a couple of times when um, guides, for example, were tired of cheetahs sleeping up on a rope, they started driving and cheetah would fall down. And of course, they would start limping after that, which is not good too. So, um, my personal opinion is that um, it's not actually good for cheetahs to be too much habituated to humans. And uh, one of the proof of that was uh, behavior of one of the cheetahs, which you see on the left hand photo, which is standing on the wheel. It's the son of the female who's sitting up on the roof. Uh, his name was Balo, which means a wing. Uh, several months later, after mother left him, we found him in a very remote area where there are no tourists at all. And he was really weird because at that time he would never let car to come closer than for 60 meters. And if car would follow the cheetah, cheetah would start rolling intensively. This is kind of a place in behavior which cheetahs actually uh, display in discomfort. Or it would start biting its tail. Uh, that's reverse aggression. You know, when we're, um, for example, irritated by someone or something, we break some objects uh, or we uh, scratch ourselves. Cheetahs, like other wildlife, birds and animals, start eating themselves. Uh, birds in captivity, like parrots, used to pull pe feathers from their chest. And uh, animals in the zoo uh, actually start eating the tail from the tip to the base. It's not curable unless you absolutely uh, take away the reason of the stress and that can help uh, animal to, uh, um, to recover. So this was the first time when we ever um, observed behavior of the cheetah like that. Very common for captive animals, but not very common, I would say very rare for the wild. So this cheetah became totally intolerant to visitors. He learned his lesson. 
probably had some very negative experience. Um, here actually, um, situation. Sometimes visitors can see a group of cheetahs, uh, for example, female with cubs or adult males, and they follow at a very short distance, follow, follow for better photos. And what happens, we can see the cheetahs start playing. But actually, if you look very attentively, it's not a game, it's not a play, because cheetahs start uh, aggressively attacking each other. It's again reverse aggression. Or you can maybe see a um, reaction like that, cheetah stands up and walks away and then starts rolling intensively, then walks away and again starts rolling. This is replacement behavior. Um, so she actually in this graph um, from one of my papers, um, I show how cheetahs react to the distance. So basically, if uh, visitors are staying beyond 25, 30 meters, cheetahs don't display any discomfort. When you come closer, they start to being very, very irritated and they change behavior a lot. But at the distance between eight and um, five meters, they actually freeze. They cannot absolutely move. It's, um, you can see it even in other animals. We've seen it in buffaloes and other species. Um, so it doesn't mean that cheetah is happy to see visitors that close. It means that it's just absolutely not happy. And when visitors are coming closer, cheetahs start moving, running, for example, away. So that's why we actually uh, support the idea of the park rules of the distance of uh, uh, 25 meters. It's optimal. Also, what was interesting, in 1979, uh, David Bernie spent 17 months in the Mara, and he found maximum number of cars, six. And he was really concerned that if tourism will grow in the Mara, uh, cheetah population will decline. Uh, but then when we came to start working with cheetahs and studying their behavior in 2002, we found 23 cars around simultaneously, around one family. And cheetahs were still there. In 2012, there were 63 vehicles around the cheetah. And it was ridiculous, really, because you can imagine people are shouting, they're trying to take better photos, they're climbing cars. So it's a lot of disturbance. And that's why together with park authorities and Naro County government, we invented uh, several new rules and some of these rules were about uh, no and wild cats allowed under the car uh, in the car or on the car and um, also some other rules by that number of simultaneously or following uh, cheetah cars dropped to 60. it was in 2015 when we invented these rules you can see the sparkles which uh, were printed and uh, were in all uh, gates and airstrips of the Mar Masai Mara National Reserve. But then we got a coalition of five, five males and uh, these five males attract so much attention. They became stars and everybody of course wanted to take good photos and again now it's a bit difficult. So right now we're working with Naro County Council um, about, um, we're working with Naro County officials um, on the new park rules, which will actually cover those types of behavior um, of tourists uh, and uh, guides, um, which will um, help not to disturb animals. So basically, uh, that's why when we started working in the Mara, when we started working in the Mara, we um, I realized that actually it's not possible for researchers to do anything alone. We have to be one team, as one team. So we're working with all the rangers of the Masai Mara National Reserve and surrounding conservancies. And um, we actually, um, 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 we, um, <laughs> um, we conduct workshop for the guides and for the rangers and update them with information about not only general cheetahs, but um, in uh, about particular cheetahs of the reserve and surrounding conservancies because cheetahs move a lot. And uh, we provide rangers and guides with ratchet water cameras with built-in GPS so they can monitor cheetahs and other animals. And also we encourage them to participate in wildlife conservation by naming animals. Because, you know, when we came in 2012 to the Mara, um, there were only two cheetahs who had names. But then we ask guides and rangers, shall we name this cheetah? And what we use is uh, something positive, like in Ma or in Swahili, uh, local languages. Uh, for this land, uh, we use some kind of description of uh, characteristics of that cheetah, maybe its character or features. And um, we're picking up very positive meaning and ask uh, guides to, uh, or rangers to translate it. Or 
or for their own names. That's how all of them actually have local names. And also we teach them how to identify cheaters. In 2004, I actually, in 2004, um, I developed cheetah methodology of uh, identification a methodology which is based on the front, back, legs, foot patterns and the tail and it's widely used so it's really easy to identify cheetahs by that. So we give lessons to rangers and then give them albums with those cheetahs which you can see. Also, we always um, invite rangers to participate in every activity which we have. For example, if there is a dead cheetah, definitely we call um, uh, rangers or oh, they call us and we um, and we um, there's something weird today maybe it's because of the rain <laughs> um, so we um, that's okay what can bite <laughs> what is the word to um, so they can participate we invite them yes yeah, so actually um, so together with rangers we're taking measurements we show them how to deal with the body and what uh, what samples do where we're taking um, so basically it's very important that local authorities know what we're doing and they support us and they develop special feeling for these animals because before uh, let's say all rangers and all um, guides are pastoralists at the same time they have their own uh, livestock so for them these animals are kind of um, predators but when they see how many problems these animals experience in the wild they develop special feeling and sometimes they're calling Elena Miali which means grace because of her foot patterns on the shoulder which uh, which uh, form like grace uh, or stripes on her shoulder she's called Miali. Miali uh, is just uh, made a kill please come over to see or we found the den of the cheetah so it's really great to work together and for those guides and rangers who support our research directly or indirectly we develop this certificate what is interesting to point out is that for example comparably to southern africa where all wildlife belongs to um, the park for example or the owner of the territory um, in eastern africa all wildlife belongs to kenya wildlife service kenyan government and parks belong to kenya wildlife service which is like top organization which is responsible for wildlife it's like environmental uh, ministry and uh, park can belong to Kenya Wildlife Service or to counties for example Maasai Mara National Reserve belongs to Narok County and each certificate which which produced for rangers and guides there is original signature of Narok County uh, government official director of Kenya Wildlife Service and us and guides and rangers really highly appreciate it and it's also encouraged them um, if we're talking about um, relationship uh, between um, local people and predators it's very complicated because on one hand um, local tribes Maasai they're sharing um, land with predators for hundreds of years and of course they know the difference uh, between leopards and cheetahs in terms of their um, features, but the confused behavior. But what is interesting, um, we find more cheetahs in grazing areas rather than in not grazing. The reason is absence of lions, because lions fearing herders. Well, cheetahs don't care about that. That's a big difference actually with Serengeti, because in the papers you can find information that cheetahs avoid grazing areas. So we were waiting for cheetahs to disappear. No, they just give way to cows to pass by and then they come to the same spot. Or they hide in the grass when they see walking people. But what is interesting, some cheetahs become really absolutely um, calm when they see big trucks or motorbikes and walking people. This wouldn't be a problem in the areas where, for example, local uh, people are tolerant towards predators. But in those areas, when um, some game, uh, some um, livestock closes uh, appear, it can cost cheetahs life because they should fear people actually. We had a case uh, in the reserve, in the edge of the reserve, when three males, uh, two males, um, we had a case in the reserve um, where two males and the female were in courtship for five days. 
and local herders could see them for five days, three cheetahs together, resting under the trees or walking together. And uh, some days we found, um, like for example, when I took this photo, there was a big herd of goat and sheep, but there was no herder with them. But cheetahs were watching them and never even moved. But then one goat came very close and then when saw cheetahs, ran away and everybody followed. Cheetahs didn't run, didn't follow. Next day, there was a claim from a um, local community that three cheetahs killed uh, the goat. Um, next day, there was a claim from the local community that these three cheetahs killed one sheep. And when Warden called me and told me about this incident, I told him that I'm right now with one of those cheetahs. And since morning, they all are separate. And there's four and two kilometers in between them. So there was no way that they could kill uh, this cheetah this morning half an hour ago and i asked to, him to bring over this uh, sheep and what i found out were two big holes in the neck very deep very thick and it's definitely not a che cheetah teeth because actually cheetah don't doesn't bite it suffocates the kill you can see small small maybe holes but not like those bleeding holes so that was a fake and you see unfortunately sometimes uh, people think that if they see these cheetahs very often they can claim for uh, this and in this case I would stand for cheetahs. Of course sometimes they take livestock but not in that case. Um, if we look into the uh, typical uh, home state or Boma or Manjata of uh, local people you will see that some areas are really not well protected. You can imagine that around the house in the upper foot and the lower foot uh, at night there are some um, animals like goat, sheep and cows. It's easy even for us to step over and to come over there. And when we're interviewing local uh, communities, we found out interesting thing. Because when we show them different photos of predators like hyena, lion, wild dog, cheetah and a leopard, uh, they tell us different between cheetah and a leopard. But then when we ask, do you like them? They say no, especially this one. And you know, in Maasai language, uh, all predators, spotted predators have the same name, Oluwaro Keri, which is spotted one. And when we ask which Oluwaro Keri is bad, they're pointing on the cheetah photo saying this one. Why? Because at night it climbs into our enclosure, picks up the goat, takes it up a tree. It's absolutely clear that it was a leopard who did it. And um, unfortunately, cheetah was blamed for that. So that's a big confusion. And um, so you can see that 89% of herders actually confuse cheetah with a leopard. And um, of course, we don't want anybody to be blamed or um, actually killed. That's why we ask local uh, communities to tell us what do they need? How would they like to be uh, their problem fixed? And then we connect them with those companies and uh, projects which provide them better proof bomb of fencing or detergent light, which is scary with predators. We are doing conservation education programs. My belief is that um, future of every land, any piece of land on earth is in the hand of youth generation. And that is so, that's why it's so important that uh, kids from the very childhood will understand the value of those animals. And several years ago in 2015, we, uh, together with Lakeipians, we developed a coloring book for kids. It has many photo, uh, many pictures, drawings, uh, of different animals which local communities don't like, like hyena, jackal, um, crocodile, hippo, elephant, of course, of course, lion, hyena, and uh, cheetah and a leopard. Um, and it contains information, scientifically proved information, but in a very simple way. And also pictures to color and poems. All the book is made by Kenyans, which is really great. And it's so talentedly made. We fundraised for printing it. Uh, and then, um, so I was a supervisor of this book, and uh, then we fundraised really easily to uh, print this book and for several thousands of books, and then we donate them to the schools. And we hope to fundraise more to print these books, because it's really important. And here we're um, conducting conservation lessons at schools. On the left hand photo, my assistant, one of them, uh, my um, Kenyan student assistant, he now became actually manager of the local conservancy in the Mara after six years of working with me. He's asking kids, so kids, tell me what cheetahs eat? What is the food of cheetahs? And one girl is saying, cow, and he's writing down on the uh, board. And then the other girl is saying, sheep, 
go and then gear up. That's what they know. So it's really important to pass the knowledge and to tell the difference between animals. And um, when we donate the books um, or when we uh, do a painting conservation lesson, art conservation lesson, um, I'm not a professional artist, but I do art. And it's really fun to uh, paint and draw with kids. Uh, we're talking about these animals and um, I'm telling them different stories for them to understand that these animals, different animals are not just aggressive, stupid creatures, but they have their right to live and we just have to find our way to coexist with them, save our lives and lives of our livestock. And for example, um, um, yeah, so also we used to take kids uh, for the game drives because you see, um, what is the predator or elephant, for example, for the local kids? It's a danger because elephants is a walking death. It comes to the village and it's crop, it crops, so it destroys the home state, uh, kill livestock and kill people. And when they're seen from the car, from the um, guest car, let's say, when they see from the vehicle um, in the park, elephant crossing the road just in two meters from the car without anyone noticing of people. And they understand that this elephant is just actually absolutely a peaceful animal. And when we see lions lying down under the tree and uh, mothers are taking care of cubs and male, for example, is in courtship with a female, they also change their perception about the species. And at first I was very, very serious. Only kids, only kids, no uh, teachers, because we don't have enough space. But then I, when I saw the eyes of the teacher, I realized that the teacher is a poor person. And it's very important for teachers to feel the same. And then what is interesting, when we come back to the same villages with books or with something else, we can see that kids actually educate their uh, grandfathers. They tell them the difference. And when we show the photo, for example, of cheetah and serval cat and tiger and asking them, when have you seen these animals? Have you seen them around? They say, no, these are not from here. Tigers are not here. Serval cats are small and cheetah is the one which we see. So it's really great thing to work with kids and uh, work with different, different people. Uh, because basically working with animals means working with people. And um, actually that's it. And thank you very much. Let's Fantastic. save cheetahs together. Fantastic. So, you know, there's, um, I worked with tigers for many, many years, Elena. I've worked um, nearly 30 years with tigers, just as you worked with cheetah. And one of the interesting things that um, struck me when we were talking was that we've actually reversed what you're talking about. Um, you know, the way you said that you gave cheetahs names because it made people more aware of individuals and created a very much stronger relationship with the animals. We used to have names for our cheetahs but the government came in and these are all people who hardly know tigers but they they rule from the center and they said that we could no longer give names to our tigers so now our tigers very sadly are named t1 and t23 and b1 and b23 i mean they sound like medicines or vitamins or something and um you know it just it's just so sad and um, I would if you have if you have any research on this or any figures about how attitudes change or any papers that you've written up or stories I would love to share this with the government and show them that even in other parts of the world it's not um, it's not that we're giving the animals a human identity it's just that we're giving them individuality and um, giving each one you know the importance of having a personality and a character so that people can can recognize them and relate to them and it's not just a blurred mixture so that would be uh, really interesting important. you know Latika, it's very interesting subject because I remember that one once I was giving a talk to one company and one uh, tour operator was really frustrated. He said, how can you call uh, animal the same name as even if it's the same name in um, Moa, for example, for a man? I said, because he's proud that uh, by him, uh, there was a cheetah name. And he said, how come it's a human name? It's not right. And I said, you know, for the database, of course, we use numbers. For example, uh, Rani, which means queen, uh, she has number eight, F8. 
So when I was posting, you see, it's again about posting, about publicity. If we were just doing research between ourselves, even now we're saying F8, F52, we know who we're talking about. Because sometimes when cheetahs go to the conservancy, they can be named differently. Some photographers name differently too, and it's very difficult. You know, sometimes one cheetah can have three names. That's why I prefer numbers, honestly saying. But when I started posting information that famous female Shakir gave birth to the female, we call her F8, people started complaining, what is F8? You know, she's so beautiful, let's name her. And we said, okay, you're welcome, just let's name. Um, I would say that if you are dealing with um, visitors, if you tell stories about these animals for, uh, to different people, it's important to give them names because people understand that they're alive creatures. Because as you pointed out absolutely correctly that T1, D2 means something like not alive, not a live thing, right? Something which doesn't breathe. Yes, yes. But uh, names are really important. Even hyenas, you know, the big clans. And I remember how uh, researchers were calling them uh, brands of cigarettes or alcohol because there are too many of them, like, you know, one one clan, for example, 175 individuals, but still they have names. Because again, when you have too many, again, it's easy to pick up a few because that would be the animals which you're observing more often or you have special stories. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. interesting thing. Uh, at, at the moment, I don't have anything like that, but it's an interesting thing and probably we should do something. Um, it's very difficult to measure anyhow uh, the attitude because it's very subjective thing. You see, for example, when you're coming to the village, for example, to interview local community, I'm coming with a car where it's written conservation project. And of course, um, elders, especially elders who have long term relationship, which is not nice with any predator, especially with hyenas. Uh, they look at me and they're saying, oh, conservation, I'm telling them, I'm sorry. Of course, we have an interpreter, the local person, I'm telling, please tell uh, them there, which means uh, old uh, gentleman, uh, please tell gentlemen that I don't want to hear the word conservation from him. I just want him to tell me what he feels when he sees this animal and I show the photo, when he is in the field and he sees this animal, what is his feeling? And person starts talking from the heart, that's what we need. We don't need just to click. We've been to this village, we interviewed 15 people, and that was the answer. Because of course they can tell you, oh, we love carnivores, of course we do. We never kill them, it's not truth. And I'm telling them, you know, if I don't know the truth, I won't be able to help you, but I would love to help you. Believe me, I cannot solve your problems, but I can connect you to someone who can. And if I know the truth, it will be easier for me. And that's why um, when we're talking, it's more personal talk. And of course, I promise that when I enter everything into the questionnaire, it will be only just for the computer. I don't even need real name of the person. We need just location on the bomb, for example, or home state. Because what is important is that these people will be here. And I'm a guest. Yes. Sometimes they were even asking me, like, Elena, what is the difference between you and others? You know, they're coming every year, they ask the same question, then they go. So because, you know, I said, I have my PhD already. I came here to learn more and to give back. I want these animals to be here tomorrow. And I know that for you it's difficult, so we are happy to help you to keep them here. And of course, it means to keep people happy. Mm -hmm. And what I found out is that it's totally impossible to change um, attitude towards uh, loving, like opposite. I hate these animals, now I love them. There is no way. People can tell, but they will never feel like that. And actually for that, when some visitors are asking me, like, how come, how, uh, how come that local people don't understand the value of those animals? I'm telling them the story. Imagine, just very simple example, imagine that you cooked very nice dinner and you served on the plate and you eager to start and then you can see cockroaches which are running from all over around and they don't all, um, even eat but they poop they defecate on your plate what would you do well, try to chase them and kill them and somebody's telling you no 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 no, don't do that because they're in the red list they're endangered what would you tell them okay i won't kill them but make sure they never come even close to my plate will you love these cockroaches because they're endangered no but you will tolerate them so that's what we want. We want people to tolerate those uh, predators around them.
And that's why maybe for years, uh, local people all over the world kill different animals, but they're still here. For example, Maasai Mara, cheetahs are still there, leopards are still there, lions, hyenas. And what is interesting, all over the world, cheetah, con uh, cheetah population declining so fast and we cannot stop it. But what we can do, we can preserve those populations which are now doing well. Because if we lose even one single animal because of um, less attention, because of um, ignorance, that would be not a fixable problem. Okay, so the other... <laughs> Yes, I mean, I totally get it and I could talk to you for a long time about comparisons between tiger work and cheetah work. But the other problem that we have um, in the field is, you know, we have even less tigers. I mean, we have 3000 tigers. And and one of the, the dilemmas we have is when we come across an injured animal or a sick cub or um, something that needs medical attention, this whole dilemma of whether we should intervene or we should not in intervene. And um, sometimes now when it's absolutely necessary and you know that it's a fatal wound and the tiger can't treat it. For instance, it's torn up a, a, a flap under the jaw and it can't lick it and it can get maggots and you know, things can be bad. Then we do tranquilize and, and uh, you know, um, do something. So how often do you intervene or do you mostly leave things alone? What is the policy you follow? Very good question. And uh, <laughs> um, I answer this question pretty often too. Okay. Uh, there is um, overall policy. First of all, researchers should not interfere. The second thing, wildlife should be left for wildlife. But you see, for example, Masai Mara is not pure wildlife. In Serengeti, um, in Tanzania, which is neighboring uh, Masai Mara, there is no interference at all. Um, but in the Mara, there's so much um, influence made by humans, by all means, tourism, pest relief, and all other things, that um, it really affects cheetahs, because cheetahs are the weakest link. And uh, by that, Kenya Wildlife Service, um, follow the procedure, they treat sick animals. Basically, the best way would be uh, maybe to leave those animals which, not, which, which are not suffering from humans. So the cause is not uh, the human or the problem. And in this case, to leave the cheetahs to survive. On the other hand, sometimes, as you uh, mentioned with this wound, uh, we have the same things, but we have agreement with Kenya Wildlife Service because our affiliated organization for our project is Kenya Wildlife Service, uh, that uh, if we get any information about sick or injured animal, we go there and we monitor this animal. If animal can take care of itself, for example, cheetah can hunt and it can lick uh, the wound, it can walk properly or run, we leave the cheetah and just monitor it and uh, usually cheetah recovers. If there is, uh, for example, a case when um, cheetah has cubs and um, it's a temporary, for example, problem, we can assist cheetahs, not we, but local authorities, rangers and park authorities, they make a decision. We as researchers just give them information, objective information. Cheetahs are fine, cheetah can walk, let's just monitor it. Or uh, in this case, for example, there is a life death problem. So maybe we should, like not we, maybe there should be uh, assistance. But it's Maro County government officials and Kenya Wildlife Service who make a final decision. We never have argues, uh, arguments about that. For example, some cheetahs have very severe mange. And uh, by mange, cheetah becomes very irritative and uh, restless and of course the hunting success goes down because cheetah is actually not resting well but we found out these cheetahs go to the bushy areas and they hunt small rabbits hares and uh, some small antelopes so they survive and then in a few months we see them in a perfect shape also you know sometimes there's a case for example when um, cheetah cubs are attacked uh, in front of visitors for example uh, by hyenas and uh, some visitors, some guides, for example, would love, of course, they don't want visitors to see such a terrible thing, 
they interfere and just stay behind or in between uh, Hyena, for example, the cheetah, and cheetah survives and everything is fine. But at the, at the same time, what happens, uh, next day you find the same cheetah female with uh, one less cup. It looks like, you know, even if we do something, nature takes its course. Um, I would say that um, in terms of cheetahs, if lions are treated, if other animals are treated, it's important for cheetahs uh, to be treated too in certain cases, but we are trying to avoid that. That's why I showed you the photo uh, of the cheetah with very big wound, because when I looked at it, I said, oh my God, I immediately called the editor of the service, and I said, you know, it's a big wound. And probably she is walking because now it's a fresh and soft, but tomorrow she will try to, she will feel it. She made a kill and she fed her four cups. And I said, okay, let's wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow she made another kill. So every day I was uh, driving for one and a half hours just to find her. And I had to make sure that I observed her. She was making kills almost every day. She recovered. That shows that cheetahs, like other animals, are really adaptable. But at the same time, they're very fragile. Uh, because if some disease, like for example, we had cat flu, uh, disease which really affected uh, six animals and four of them died. Uh, but uh, two of them retreated. Unfortunately, only one survived. Uh, out of two again it's about immunity if immunity is high uh, it will be easier for animal to uh, to uh, recover but what contributes to low immunity stress and stress is not just people it can be weather it can be lack of hunting it can be a weakness temporary weakness which um, uh, yeah. becomes a problem for hunting or something else so there is a complex of things that's why when we're observing cheetahs even i feel very very much responsible about that because you know uh for example my car for a long time was uh white like in rangers but then i realized that um it attracts attention so for example if i'm observing a cheetah everybody is uh, calling on radio saying oh mama duma is there so it's a cheetah let's go that's great we found the cheetah uh, mama Dum means cheetah woman and I was given this nickname uh, in 2001 when I started working in Masai Mara uh, and rangers and guides gave me this nickname and I'm proudly um, wearing this name. Uh, so it's a big responsibility. When I'm following the cheetah, you know, it's really interesting because um, um, sometimes cheetahs really understand that we're kind of protecting them because uh, some visitors are coming uh, on the road and asking, can we go there closer? and take photos and I'm saying no because this female was walking all the night we found her very early in the morning here but she was 10 kilometers away and she's exhausted she needs to sleep because if she's disturbed it means that at night she might be more vulnerable so no if you want to take photos please wait until maybe uh, five o'clock or uh, because of the posture and sun I can predict when she will change position a posture and I can tell maybe you can wait until like 15 minutes or 17 and then it will take some photos and it works awesome. so <laughs> fantastic it's... okay so mama duma um that's a great name um <laughs> tell me um tell me a little bit about how you use visitors to help you with uh monitoring i believe you get visitors to give you photographs how if Effective has that been? What is the system you use? Can we use it for other cats in other parts of the world, do you think? Uh, there are different actually ways to work with visitors because you know there's some applications and there's so many of them. But what I found out for people, it's a little bit difficult to, for example, to send lots of information. It's easy to share photos. So sometimes um, we're in the field and we uh, meet some visitors and ask them if they have seen any cheetah. And they're saying, yes, there is a cheetah, for example, like two kilometers away, but animals move. And what happens, for example, there are a few cars and cheetahs lying down somewhere where everybody can see it. And then when the lost car leaves, cheetah change uh, uh, location. It goes like 15 meters and disappears in the grass or in the bush and you can't see it. It's for the purpose, just to be not followed. And by that, you can lose this opportunity. You never know who is that. Because what we found out that some cheetahs disappear for one and a half years and then they appear. So basically they're there, but we don't see them. And it's good because we cannot consider them dead, for example. And um, so when we uh, see visitors, 
uh, and they tell us that this is soy cheetah, I usually ask for the photo. If people have time, I have laptop with me and I just copy this photo. Or uh, with a camera, I can take a shot from their camera because I can identify. If people are more interested or they have spotted something absolutely unique, for example, cheetah made a kill of unusual animal like water bug, it happens very rare, or something else happened, like for example, fighting between two males, or four sheep, anything. Uh, by that, uh, I ask for original photos, and I promise that I will never use them without the permit. And uh, if I ever use it, I will definitely ask the permission, like written permission, uh, with the name, of course, of the person. Like you can see photos, uh, if they're not signed, it's our photos, but those which are signed are photos taken or given you know, for this purpose by other uh, uh, friends, photographers, and visitors. So basically, um, by that, the person will get full information about that cheetah by email. I give my card, and then the person sends the information, and I tell the story, and that really helps. Also, in some cases, when um, visitors contributed a lot of, for example, photos from the, uh, when visitors contribute photos from the previous years, it really helps to build pedigree. For example, when I started in 2011, um, uh, like follow-up research from 2001, 2002, I met with one of the photographers who used to come every year to the Mara for many times, Federico Veronese, and uh, I asked him for photos and he's so generous, he's so dedicated person. He said, of course. So he invited me to his house in Nairobi and for six hours I was pointing to the photos uh, on the screen saying this one, this one, this one. And he said, these are the same. I said, no, these are different. Uh, subconsciously, you can read the difference. I cannot tell which is the difference, but I just know because I'm with identification for a long time. And um, he helped me to build pedigree, the initial ones, because I got photos from 2004 to date up to 2011. Even now, he gives some photos. Then sometimes you can meet the person who is uh, guiding for uh, four or five years or take as uh, two operators taking uh, guests. And he also has like 400 photos, like uh, John Brissett. And he gave me only 400 photos, not 4,000 like uh, Federico, but uh, only 400. But I found two parents of the cheetahs, which I was observing. So it's, it's absolutely amazing. And of course, for these visitors, for example, we ask them to pick up sometimes, like for special people, we ask them to pick up some cheetah and maybe give them the full story of the cheetah, illustrated with best photos we've taken, it's just to encourage them to, uh, uh, so it, I yeah. haven't done it with Federica because you know he actually has so good photos that you can see I use them a lot, even the front one is Federica's photo. He, it's absolutely amazing. So there's so many great photographers who are supporting us and supporting us with uh, data, supporting us with sightings and uh, with connection of people. Um, with fundraising, it's really amazing. Like Margot Rajat, she uh, helped us to fundraise for the book uh, for kids. I'm I'm a part of Wildlife Photographers United, and some of my pictures are in those books as well. You're so lucky. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. So anything to help out. And um, now that yeah. now that you've told me, I'm going to go back and look for my old cheetah pictures as well and pull them out and send them. Yes, that would be great. You know, because if you have the date in these pictures, uh -huh. that can work. Perfect. I will be very happy to tell you who you saw. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I'll spread the word to all my friends who are also photographers and say... Do a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, no, we can sort them out and send them to you by year and I can help because I, I recognize animals like you do as well. So, you know, I think... I think with tigers it's a bit more difficult. I mean, even to spot tigers. Um, we had a one lady who came to volunteer for a short time. She was uh, from India and she used to volunteer at... Um, one of the reserve in India, very famous one. Ranthambore, Kanha, Bandavgar, Corbett. Corbett, 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 Corbett absolutely, yes. Okay. So um, we had one volunteer from India who was volunteering at Corbett. And once, one time, I showed her how I identified the cheetah in the field. Immediately, she was pointing, like, there's a cheetah. I said, where? There. And when she explained to me how difficult it is, how uh, it's possible to find, for example, a tiger, I said, oh my God, of course, it's more difficult to find tiger. That's why it was easy for her to see cheetahs. <laughs> that was really great. You know, she was so good in yeah. spotting. Yeah, yeah, no, we're very, we're very, very easy with for us because tigers is just, 
um and and much more than tigers leopards leopards are just almost impossible to find in india because you take your eyes off them and they've totally blended um yeah. the bush and and i've just been talking to two friends about snow leopards snow leopards are just you know they're just merged in the background you don't see them at all so it's it's uh, amazing well this is wonderful thank you so much i have so many more questions but i'm i want to talk to you one last thing before our t- conversation tomorrow what do you do if you find often cubs what what do what do you do in the mara if you have cheetah cubs um you know if a mother gets killed and somebody finds the cubs where do you take them what do you do with them what is what is what happens? another good question you know very good question basically we don't find orphan cubs because if mother is killed um she's hiding cubs unless they're sub adults or they're like a few months when they're already walking uh, independently mm-hmm. but usually you know we haven't seen cheetah killed um instantly in front of us there were cases where uh, which were reported mostly about males but not females but uh we had couple of cases when cheetahs disappeared and cubs were just roaming around and visitors uh were telling us that it's the second day when they're calling and they're hungry so we report to Kennewick the service and Narrow County government and actually they're taken to uh the orphanage in Nairobi um why i pointed out that cheetahs can adopt cubs uh because maternity instinct is so strong that I would prefer to find the mother with a cubs of a certain age and introduce because the level of survival will be still low because um but at least these cheetahs will live and when they grow up uh they will have more chances if they die they will die naturally because um it doesn't uh, keeping cheetahs in captivity for example in east africa unfortunately doesn't contribute to survival of the species because we cannot breed them here or sell them or exchange and also all um, all zoos in europe and america have actually not uh, eastern african subspecies but it's only cebada cebada um south african subspecies so these cheetahs are just ending up living sometimes well sometimes not they die um you don't so reintroductions and rewilding because this is something that we're now talking of yes i see yeah. for for that what i can say there are two very important things and they're critically important the first one mm-hmm. um cheetahs have inborn um skills or instinct of hunting mm-hmm. they just need to um um let's say improve it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but only mother can explain to the cubs what is danger and what is not danger for example mother is lying down and the tortoise is coming mother doesn't even move the head so cubs no that's that's fine we can play if there is a monitor lizard she's very intensely looking and she's leaving cubs a little bit to the side because she doesn't want them to be in trouble if there is a snake totally different behavior if there's a lion what to do to expose yourself to provoke the lioness or lion or to run away or to hide what to do only mother can show and the most successful mothers really show how to behave and cub survival rate is higher in those females and we can see it from generation to generation not all of course cheetahs all cheetahs are um, equal of course some of them better some not but a successful mother can spread more uh, knowledge to her cubs and by that what happens uh there were many many cases in south africa for example the cub can be raised um and then released but it can survive with the area in the areas where the hyenas but with lions it could be a problem especially there are many lions and what happens cheetahs have to um not only hunt successfully and not lose the kill but also not to lose a life because when they're in captivity they feel safe for example i observed two uh, cheetah cubs who were supposed to be released um in one place and um i could see that they behave totally differently from those their um uh, like sisters and brothers in the wild because in the wild for example in masamara uh, either a two cheetahs they will take turn in vigilance one will be watching one sleeping it's very rare when the both will be flat in that case both cheetahs were flat 
simultaneously. So basically, if there is a danger, they wouldn't identify it. Also, those cheetahs who, uh, who spend even with one person, human, uh, more time might be more vulnerable because they don't fear. For example, those cheetahs who used to climb cars or come too close to cars, they come very close to villages. And imagine that this cheat is hungry because of some reason, for example, it's a little bit weak or limping and it cannot hunt for itself. The easy kill would be chicken or goat or sheep. And normally, cheetahs are supposed to run from people. But if cheetah is very hungry, even when lioness or hyena is coming, cheetah is trying to bite a little bit, a little bit. By that, it can be killed too. So there are so many problems. On one hand, you see even for local population, it's important to, to tolerate animals. But what you can do if your only treasure, your livestock is attacked by a cheetah, you don't care if it's, you know, a vulnerable species because cheetahs should stay away from livestock, period. For that, they have to fear people. And that's another thing. So if you're raising the cub, you cannot avoid contact. So yes. they will associate food with a human. I, we haven't tried, but it would be really good to try, for example, if there is a case, uh, to have a big enclosure and then to have in another enclosure um, some antelopes or rabbits or something like that and just give opportunity to anim for animals to do that. For example, in the zoo, when I was working in the zoo in the conservation center in Moscow, um, we had to kill rabbits to feed cheetahs and I felt it or chicken and I felt not really comfortable about that. Uh, I knew that it's a little bit maybe sounds cruel, but I decided to teach cheetahs how to kill. And when you give the first chicken, it takes 20, um, I recorded 23 minutes until the kill because cheetah doesn't know how to do it. It's adult already, it was born in captivity, raised in captivity, fed with meat and bone and now it has this, you know, a lot um, animal. But then next time, when you um, give the chicken, it takes it immediately. The same with rabbit. With rabbit, it was uh, nine minutes, but five minutes uh, killed. There was interesting case uh, in the zoo. We had different cages and um, they were separated by the fence so animals could see each other. And um, I brought to those cheetahs, which uh, like were like treated, so I had to give them some medicine. So we gave them the rabbit body in the bowl. Metal bowl is usually and for the last cheetah, uh, which I wanted to hunt, actually, I uh, put the alive uh, rabbit into the um, uh, cage. And cage is big, it's like nine square uh, meters. And then also the enclosure, but she was close for feeding. So cheetah looked into the rabbit, sniffed it, and then was looking at me like, where is the food? Where is the food? I, I can see this something, but it's not the food. I realized I put her empty bowl immediately. Cheetah went for the rabbit, killed it, and put it into the bowl, started eating. <laughs> That's amazing. What an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, so basically, you see, um, so about teaching of, um, let's say, uh, hunting, it's not a problem, absolutely. Of course, another thing. In the wild, cheetah will go for inappropriate prey. Mother is sitting and there were dogs. And mother will actually look what uh, cubs were doing. Because cubs are hungry, for example. They're going for war dog. And of course, mother war dog will chase them. And in this case, mother cheetah will interfere and lead away the word dog from the cubs. And by that, cubs learn, okay, that's not appropriate thing, but let's treat piglets. And some of them really specialize on taking piglets. One cub will run and attract attention, other will hunt the piglet. And the mother, for example, will attract attention of the mother uh, word dog. So there are different, different methodologies. That what happens to uh, collisions of males or females, because one would attract attention of a couple of them and others are going around. The same females with subadult cubs. We have now a uh, female in the mother with subadult cubs, which are six. And of course, to feed seven mouths is very difficult for the female. So that's what she does. She just put cubs somewhere they're sitting and she's hiding on the bush and then antelopes are very curious sometimes they can see cheetahs and don't understand why they're not attacking so antelope is coming closer that what um topis are too big for them but um impalas and grant and tommy gazelles thompson gazelles are doing they're coming closer and that where from the mother ambushes. so there's so many amazing things about that yeah so with hunting 
So uh, just the last thing I want to just say that actually with hunting, it's easier because sooner or later cheetahs will find out, especially if they were trained, uh, well, given opportunity to learn, I would say, right? But with danger, it will be very difficult because you see, how can you explain to the cheetah that you are friendly, you're human, it doesn't matter if it's you or some other person, humans, you smell human, you're smiling, you're walking like human, you're wearing clothes like humans, and then tomorrow you're just chasing me. So they have to be, that's why actually I'm thinking that the best way would be to introduce cubs to another female. If I have a few animals, like for example, Iranian cheetahs, there is no game like that because they're so vulnerable, there's so few of them, probably with tigers too. It's better maybe to, um, to arrange some kind of the area where competitors are less yes. or where there is a lot of, um, a food source, so food source is so uh, abandoned that um, it doesn't affect uh, competition. Because there are some publications about cheetahs that uh, lines, uh, numbers or line density doesn't affect cheetah survival. And I was so interested, I said, you know, this is one phrase from the publication, let me read the whole um, paragraph. And the paragraph was, it's about fenced area, about human maintained uh, area where numbers of lions, cheetahs and hyenas are actually artificially maintained. And of course, if you have a lot of prey, there will be less competition. So you can't talk about real wildlife, real wilderness areas, and those which are managed by humans. Fantastic. I could talk to you for the rest of the evening, but I'm going to leave it till tomorrow. And I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much, Elena. And um... Thank you. study conducted which looked at both clouded leopard populations and leopard populations.